Hi everyone, so this is a video that is going to help you review for your Unit 1A test. Um, this test is going to be Tuesday, September 10th, which is tomorrow. Hopefully you are watching this Monday night or sometime during the day on Tuesday to get you ready for the exam. Um, on this video, we're going to take a look at the biomes material and the biogeochemical cycles material that will be on the test. There will also be a question or two directly related to scientific method material. You'll be given some kind of experimental data uh, or information and you will have to analyze that information and select an answer. Um, there will be 25 multiple choice questions on the test. Uh, and you will have all class period to get it finished. It will be on Canvas. Um, you will have to finish within the class period. So I usually give you guys like 10, 15 minute warnings to make sure you are on pace to get ready um, to finish up on time. Um, once the bell rings, test gets submitted and we're done. All right, so let's start with reviewing a little bit about biomes and the uh, different types of air circulation uh, and climate issues that you will need to know about that will influence where biomes are located. Um, one of the first things we went over in class, and you should have a picture of this drawn in your notes as well, and I'd highly recommend going back over your notes in addition to this video. Um, but Hadley cell circulation is something you will need to know. If you look at the picture that is on the right, um, you guys will need to know that Hadley cell circulation um, is going to begin at the equator. So that's going to be at your zero degree latitude mark. Um, you are going to have air circulate up and over um, as you can see in the Hadley cell picture, but notice that that warm moist air that is going up into the atmosphere is cooling and drying down because it's releasing a lot of its precipitation or moisture. All of that kind of gets dumped over the rainforests around the equator, hence why there's a lot of rainforest there. But as that cooler and drier air circulates up and over towards the 30 degree north and 30 degree south mark, you can see that it is going to be drying out and sinking um, but as it sinks, it's also going to warm back up as it approaches the Earth. So consequently, around those 30 degree north and south marks, we tend to see a lot of deserts. Uh, and in fact, if you were to go look at a map and find where the Sahara Desert is in Africa, um, you would see that it lines up really close to um, that 30 degree north mark. Okay, another environmental aspect of biomes you should be familiar with is the rain shadow, um, which it seemed like a lot of you had some trouble with this question on the assignment that we did in class. So what you should be aware of is that rain shadows normally occur when you have um, warm, moist air coming off of some kind of coastal area heading towards mountains. Uh, so for example, the Andes in South America, that air is going to head in towards the mountains. So like my arrow there. Um, but it kind of gets stuck in a way on those mountains and what that does is it forces a lot of that air up. Well, just like with Hadley cells where a lot of the moisture gets released as the air rises um, because it's cooling and condensing, you're going to see all of that rain drop um, on the windward side of the mountain. Well, after we have the windward side of the mountain getting soaked in all that rain, all that cold, dry air is going to make it to the leeward side of the mountain. So very much again like that Hadley cell circulation where the cool dry air kind of wraps around to the 30 degree mark. In this case, it's just going over a mountain instead. You can see that cool dry air coming around the other side. And as it approaches um, the area where you're gonna see your desert, it is going to be very dry. It's going to start to warm up approaching the surface of the earth again, and it is going to create those hot dry desert areas on the other side of the mountains. So, so again, we see these with the Andes in South America. We also see them with um, the deserts that are found uh, where Nevada is as well due to the mountains in California. All right, here's a real quick overview of your biome types that you should be familiar with. Um, we all pretty much know that rainforests have lots of plants um, and that are, they're also very wet and very hot um, and located near the equator. Um, basically, your biome pictures that you guys did in class where you colored everything in to kind of get a general gist of where they're located around the earth, um, you should be familiar with that as well. Uh, we should know that savannas are going to be grassy. Um, there's lots of grazers, but one of their key facts is that they have rainy and dry seasons, so they can be prone to um, fires as well. Um, deserts, hot, dry, and then also know that the plants are specially adapted to avoid water loss. Just think cacti. 
uh, boreal forest and taiga or even coniferous forests, all of those are interchangeable. They are going to be very cold, wet, um, usually located right below tundras, so think like Canada or Russia. Um, lots of evergreen, pines, and what I just consider Christmas trees. Just think about when you go by a live Christmas tree, what they look like. That's the kind of trees you find in those areas. Um, tundras are found north of that. They're going to be near the Arctic Circle. Um, so very, very, very northern Canada. Uh, very, very cold, very dry. Um, and you should know that permafrost, that frozen ground, prevents tree growth because the roots are not able to penetrate into it. Um, deciduous forests, these are going to be our hardwood forests that we find in the eastern United States. Usually these areas um, are noted because they have four seasons. Um, you're going to see again really warm summers, you're going to see cold snowy winters, and then your more moderate fall and spring. Um, grasslands, the central part of the U.S. or the Midwest, uh, great for agriculture, good fertile soil, lots of grass, Lots of grazers in those areas as well. Kind of similar to savanna, but not so much the rainy and dry seasons. And then chaparral or scrub areas are going to have pretty hot summers. And one of their main characteristics is they are prone to uh, forest type fires in those areas. So when we see some of our California wildfires, um, a lot of those are due to that area not only being very hot um, and experiencing drought, but that chaparral area also is common uh, for fires as well. Okay, you might want to pause um, in just a second and review this list of common locations that we see or well-known locations that we see these biomes in um, because you will sometimes be asked to identify them on a map for the AP exam. Um, for me, I ask you a question about one of these and you're going to need to be able to identify where it is. So if you paid attention to the map project that we did in class um, and saw, for example, that tundras are really far north, Tigers are located right below it, tends to be in Canada and Russia, um, that we see deserts, again, just north and south of the rainforest at the equator, you should be in pretty good shape. Um, so hopefully your geography classes that you guys have had will come in handy here. So you may want to pause, take a look over this, uh, and review it, and then we'll move on to the next slide. All right, last big thing I really want you to make sure you know with your biomes. Um, you can review the map that I've got posted down there as far as where these biomes are located. Um, in addition to the last slide that had the countries listed for you, but you should also know that climate is what determines where biomes are located. So if you have a very hot, very wet area, you are not going to find a desert there. Okay, deserts are hot and dry. So temperature and moisture of an area is really going to determine what kind of plant life, what kind of animals, um, whether or not there's rain, snow, etc. is going to be there. And then also remember as you move from the north or south pole toward the equator, you're getting hotter and you're getting wetter. So you're going to have higher rainfall, higher temperatures on average. We do know that there's some exceptions based on like how Hadley cell circulation works and whatnot. But in general, as you move towards the equator, you're getting hotter and wetter. Or if you start at the equator and move toward the north and south pole, that you are going to be getting cooler and drier. All right, on to our aquatic biomes. So you should be familiar with your freshwater and marine biomes. Um, kind of just the basics on these. You guys know what freshwater versus ocean is. Um, but freshwater, just know lakes, rivers, and ponds are your big ones. Um, you should know the difference between oligotrophic and eutrophic lakes. Um, if you can remember eutrophication, which meant a lot of algae growth, um, due to nutrients, that's kind of what you get with eutrophic lakes as well. They're super highly productive because there's lots of algae um, and lots of nutrients there for the algae to grow. Um, and then oligotrophic lakes are going to be your lower productivity, low algae, low nutrient. They're really clear, really pretty. You're going to find them in mountain ranges, for example. Um, you're just not going to see the same amount of algae growth that you see in eutrophic lakes. So just think eutrophic lake, eutrophication, both have to do with lots of algae. Uh, marine biomes, you should definitely know coral reefs and definitely know abyssal zones. Um, coral reefs are super diverse. Think lots of fish, lots of different types of corals, lots of light. So they're in a photic zone. Uh, and they're known for coral, which coral is made up of a calcium carbonate shell. That's kind of one of their defining characteristics for that ocean zone. Abyssal zones, think about our tube worm assignment we did in class. They're going to be super deep sea areas, super high pressure, absolutely no light. So they are considered aphotic. Um, and sorry, aphotic should be all smushed together in that word there. Um, high pressure, and then also specially adapted organisms like the tube worms we talked about in class. So they might be doing chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis since there's no light. Uh, and then also know that the open ocean is full of lots of algae, which is also known as phytoplankton. So there's plenty of photosynthesizing going on. 
Okay, now for our freshwater uh, and marine zones that you should be familiar with. You're definitely going to want to know um, your littoral and limnetic zones. So your littoral zone is going to be found right up here near the coastline of any freshwater lake uh, area uh, or even near a river lake edge where you're going to have plenty of plant life growing in it. Um, there's plenty of sunlight there, so it, think of it a little bit like the coral reef part of a lake. Um, limnetic is going to be more your open area. Uh, and then you should also know that benthic is going to be located at the lake floor. So where I just drew that red line down there. Um, but littoral and limnetic are the two ones in particular, two freshwater lakes you should know. Again, littoral near the edge of the lake, plenty of plants. Limnetic is kind of the open part of the lake. As far as your uh, ocean zones, the ones that you should be familiar with over here, definitely know your photic and your aphotic, so light and no light zones. You should know the term abyssal zone, so you can see down where our hot vents are, like we learned about with tube worms in class. Benthic, again, is that sea floor or lake floor, if you're talking about lakes. Um, those are going to be your big ones, but it couldn't hurt to also know intertidal zone, which is going to have a wide diversity of life that has to be used to either being covered in water some of the time, not covered in water other parts of the time. Uh, it's kind of inconsistent for them, so they're specially adapted to not be solely underwater type organisms. So those will be your big ones for your different types of zones. All right, now on to your biogeochemical cycles. Um, big one here is going to be carbon cycles. So what we need to know with that, um, there's a picture over on the right that you will see on your test, um, and you'll have various questions attached to that. Uh, so I thought I'd go ahead and give you the little preview of this mini version of the carbon cycle. You guys know it's way more complicated than that picture. So you should know that humans contribute by combusting fossil fuels and that we also have um, carbon sinks and reservoirs, uh, including things like forests, uh, so trees, for example, because they live so long, oceans, so not only the open water, uh, but also deep ocean sediments, fossil fuels, the atmosphere, uh, rocks and soil, the things that we went over with your carbon cycle game in class should help you uh, with those. Now, other things with carbon cycle you should know. You can see, again, that human uh, sorry contribution over here with industry. That's going to be a big part. You should know your little mini cycle that we talked about with cellular respiration, releasing carbon dioxide, photosynthesis, bringing carbon dioxide back into plants to help convert it um, so that organisms can use it. And that's the plant part of it right there. You can see cellular respiration coming up from animals over here as well. Um, decomposition is going to be another big part of it. Decomposition can eventually lead to fossil fuel formation over millions and millions of years. Um, and those are going to be all your big key components right there. Again, that human contribution through combustion, photosynthesis, cellular respiration. Um, those are going to be the big things that you need to know. All right, so just to touch on photosynthesis and respiration a little bit more, um, here is that cycle in and of itself. Um, you can see with photosynthesis, you're producing oxygen and glucose, which is a carbon compound, um, from carbon dioxide and water being taken in. So glucose, remember, is C6. There's your carbon part. H12. O six. You should be familiar with its actual formula. Um, so that's where that carbon dioxide going in is being converted into another carbon compound. And then animals, insects, for example, are going to take in that glucose and they're going to respire and breathe out the CO2. So that's its own little mini cycle within the carbon cycle. You should be familiar with it, that photosynthesis pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Respiration adds it to the atmosphere. And then uh, respiration is also going to take in glucose, its carbon compound as well, but that's not an atmospheric form of carbon. It's just um, a sugar carb sugar compound. You should also be familiar with the major steps of the water cycle. Um, I gave you a simple picture here that shows a few of the key things. Um, so you should know that evaporation is water going from liquid to gaseous form. Water can condense and become clouds um, or water vapor. That can rain, so that's precipitation, and notice that shows snow and rain. Um, snow is actually a form of precipitation. Precipitation can lead to runoff, okay? And that runoff can actually become part of groundwater through percolation, 
which is not on here, but it is on your notes. Uh, and then we can have that water also go back into surface water, which can then start everything over again with evaporation, transpiration, which is evaporation off of plants, and everything just continues to cycle. So just be familiar with those main parts of the water cycle. You will have a picture and you will have to be able to identify what they are. Key parts of the nitrogen cycle that you'll need to be familiar with um, are listed on this slide. And then you can also review uh, the diagram from your notes that we did with Bellwork where I had you guys labeling some compounds. Definitely no nitrogen fixation, which is where bacteria is pulling nitrogen out of the atmosphere and it is using its roots, uh, or sorry, the bacteria is located on the roots of the plant. So plants are using the bacteria located on their roots to undergo nitrogen fixation which is going to help pull that nitrogen from the atmosphere. That's gonna create a plant-friendly form of nitrogen um, that can be used. Plants are not able to take nitrogen just right out of the atmosphere themselves. You should also be familiar with denitrification, which is kind of the opposite where nitrogen is being released by bacteria back into the atmosphere. So those are gonna be your big ones. Um, you can see there's also what we talked about in class with ammoniafication, where we have ammonia uh, being converted by bacteria. Notice a lot of bacteria is involved in the nitrogen cycle. That's going to be one of the key components is just the bacterial involvement. So again, nitrogen fixation, bacteria being pulled um, or bacteria pulling nitrogen from the atmosphere uh, while they're attached to the roots of plants to make it accessible to the plants. That's actually a form of symbiosis and denitrification, the release of nitrogen into the atmosphere by those um, similar kind of bacteria as well. For phosphorus cycle, the main thing you need to make sure you remember is that phosphorus does not have an atmospheric or gaseous form. Um, so we see it cycling through plants and animals, its organic forms. Um, we see it also cycling through rocks. Um, the main way it makes it into the environment from the rocks is through weathering. So part of the uh, phosphorus kind of gets washed away um, by different environmental factors. You should also know that nitrogen and phosphorus are considered limiting factors for the growth of plants and algae. So this is why we often use them in fertilizers, um, which we'll talk about with water pollution later in the year. Um, but for now, what you should know is that too much of those fertilizers can cause eutrophication uh, or algae overgrowth when too much ends up washed into waterways. And then we know that algae can also end up dying, eating up oxygen as it's decomposing, and that can end up causing hypoxia or a lack of oxygen in the water. And that ultimately is why eutrophication is such a problem for other organisms within aquatic biomes. All right, so those are all the key components of the Unit 1A test that you need to make sure you are aware of. Um, so watch this video as many times as you need. Please make sure you review your notes. Definitely look at pictures in your notes. Um, if you go back through and look at pretty much every note sheet that we've had so far this year, all the fill in the blanks, don't forget to review the scientific method notes. Uh, hopefully you will be nice and ready for your test tomorrow, and I wish you the best of luck. I am sure you are all going to do wonderfully.